Uh, welcome, everyone. Make a, if we can make a start. We've only got an hour before the meeting, so um, uh, I think we need to make the best use of the time. Uh, my name's Andrew Puddifat. I'm the chair of the support unit, which provides the administrative backup to the Freedom Online Coalition. Freedom Online Coalition was launched in 2011 uh, in a meeting in The Hague. At the time, consisted of 11 countries. There are now 30 governments who are a member of the coalition, and those, each of those countries has pledged to find ways of promoting human rights and democracy online. And it's a unique coalition among governments uh, within the internet sphere that's focused exclusively on promoting human rights. We're going to have some uh, contributions from the governments to give us a bit of context as to where we've got now. I'm then going to bring in Ambassador Fitchen from Germany. Germany is, become, is now the chair of the Freedom Online Coalition and assumed that chairmanship yesterday, formally. Um, so we hear about the very exciting plans the Germans have got for the coalition in the next year. And then we hear from a couple of colleagues about the advisory network, which is the opportunity for civil society in the business community, in the academic community, to participate in the work of the coalition. And that's obviously something particularly relevant to probably people in the room. Um, I've got, fantastically, I've got a hammer, which I've never had before, chairing a meeting. So in the shower this morning, I was actually singing the Beatles song, Maxwell's Silver Hammer, to myself about a serial killer who uh, has a little silver hammer. So if the mood strikes me and I start wandering around the audience with the hammer, you'll know what to prepare. Someone should wrestle me to the ground because it means I finally lost, my, finally lost my mind. But hopefully that won't happen and I'll stay confined to my uh, schoolroom at the top and facilitate the meeting. So I'm going to start, first of all, by asking Peret Erb from Estonia to just give us a sense of the coalition's development to date, how we got here, and the kinds of things the coalition has been involved in, just to give you a bit of background. Peret? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrea. I'm Bira Turb, and I'm coming from Estonia, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I just uh, talk a few words after, um, after Estonian chairmanship, but uh, what the Freedom Online Coalition has been doing and, uh, and how we reached here where we are today. So Estonian chairmanship was 2013-2014, um, and it uh, ended up with, uh, with the Italian agenda for Freedom Online, which you probably know, which is uh, one of the coalition's uh, main principal documents next to the Hague Declaration, Hague uh, Founding Declaration. Uh, after Estonia, Mongolia took over the chairmanship, as the um, FUC chairmanship normally rotates also by the continent, not only by the countries. Um, so after Mongolia, um, the FOC chairman uh, moved to Latin America, so there was Costa Rica. And uh, after that, um, the, the group of the friends of the chair was, uh, was in charge of uh, bringing forward the coalition. Uh, so, and, uh, and now we have, we have Germany who just started yesterday. But, um, but the main uh, steps in the middle there uh, has been, uh, the, there was a San Jose uh, work plan which was adopted. So everybody had understood that the terms of reference uh, which the coalition had since Nairobi 2012, that it became a bit, uh, okay, <laughs> that, that it has become a bit old and was, was not what was needed anymore. So uh, there was a need to really to, to renew and to, um, and to work out the revised terms of reference. And, and now the, the new one is more, more substantial, really, and there are also members' responsibilities, and, uh, and there's evaluation framework for a member review, and, uh, and all, the, all the other necessary things. So the very important meeting was, um, was uh, during uh, Stockholm Internet Forum, where uh, Freedom Online co co Coalition countries were sitting together like nearly, uh, nearly two full days and working towards these new terms of reference, which I just mentioned. So there have been also new um, uh, efforts to enhance with, um, to enhance our cooperation with the civil society. When uh, working groups, uh, Freedom Online working groups, there were free working groups, when mm -hmm. the working groups uh, worked, we had very, very close uh, cooperation with, uh, with all the other stakeholders. 
but the working groups got their uh, objectives done and uh, um, and uh, and the goals achieved. So after after that, uh, we also want to. Um, continue with a multi-stakeholder engagement. So uh, this has always been uh, one of the goals for FOC and this is, this is continuously very important for us. So there, there will be a new call, but that, that you will hear very, very soon from the colleagues sitting on the other side of Andrew. Um, and 2017 was also the year where the first uh, program of action as, as such was, was created. So that was like a kind of first attempt to work in a more uh, strategical um, approach and, uh, and, um, and to planify strategically the, uh, the work in order to, to get to be done more than, than in the past. Um, so uh, FUC has become uh, one of the leader force in, uh, in global norm development on the human rights online as there have been uh, quite many um, joint statements which, which are creating global norms. And, uh, and now there is also um, a plan um, program of action for 2018, which is not finalized, but, but of course Germany is, is going to talk more about it, which is, I mean, these, these two are very, very important steps also for, for FOC and for FOC members. So I guess this is more or less all what I wanted to say. And, and also, of course, FOC um, continuously supports our uh, DDP, um, Digital Defenders Partnership. So there are the members of FOC who are, who are the members of that and always contributing, so which means that uh, online voices and are always very important and, uh, and that, that part has always been there and always, always continues. And there are some additional members also. So thanks. Thank you very much, Perret. I now move to Ambassador Fitchin from Germany to set out Germany's plans for the coalition in the coming year. Ambassador. Yeah, Andrew, thank you very much. Um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to sit up here and present the German work program for the uh, Freedom Online Coalition 2018. It's a great honor for my country to uh, have found this support of everyone within the coalition so that we can take over the, the chairmanship of the, of the coalition. Let me remind you uh, of, the, of the mission of the, of the purpose of the Freedom Online Coalition. Freedom Online Coalition describes itself as a group of governments deeply committed to the human rights and fundamental freedoms proclaimed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We commit to working together and with all others who share these views to support internet freedom and protect fundamental human rights. And the coalition also aims to be, and this is really the key word I like, I like best, FOC aims to be a proactive coalition that ensures internet freedom issues are on the international policy agenda as a way to drive concrete policy changes and outcomes. Keep things on the agenda, but not for the purpose of having an agenda, but really for uh, coming up with the policy change and, and concrete results. So that's more or less our, our guiding principle. We take over the chairmanship uh, at a time, Andrew and uh, that it has already been pointed out that after the, with the new Stockholm Terms of Reference, we have basically a new set of procedural uh, guidelines for our own work. And we have also introduced a new mechanism, which is the advisory network that we will talk about a little later. So those two texts and that new mechanism will have to uh, be developed and actually be transformed into practice. So one of the first tasks of our work next year will be to make sure that all of this really gains traction and that it really becomes a reality, including, of course, the advisory network. In terms of substance, I just mentioned we want to make a difference. We are a proactive coalition. Following from the uh, Stockholm conference and as outlined in our program of action, which is still a draft, not exactly uh, agreed, but almost done. We have identified three 
target areas and three main uh, points of activity. One is uh, to look at global norms that seek to prevent and limit state-sponsored restrictions to human rights online. Here, of course, Geneva is uh, one of the main uh, pr premises and, and places where our action will be hopefully felt with all the different resolutions that come up in the Human Rights Council. And it's not just the, the privacy online or the internet freedom resolution, but there are also, as you all know, resolutions on human rights defenders, which of course has a, may have an important uh, connection with the online, freedom online issues. We have a resolution on internet freedom, which is run by Sweden, that is coming up for renewal. We have a, uh, activities in the Human Rights Council to protect uh, and defend the uh, workspace of, of civil society and human rights defenders, so that is something that we may wish to uh, support by drafting a joint statement, joint statement of the coalition. Uh, we're also thinking of having a joint statement on internet censorship. That of course is being, those things are being drafted not by not by us, not by Germany, but uh, that's a collective process that would involve all coalition members and of course with the active help of the Secretariat. Second area of activity would be supporting civil society voices online. So we're thinking about uh, drafting, again, when I say we, I mean the coalition. The coalition thinks about developing a statement on digital divides. Uh, we're also thinking of initiatives that uh, FOC could encourage that close digital divides and build capacity for uh, participation of marginalized groups in freedom online activities, so bringing in uh, other players and making sure that the coalition, 30 members with the uh, proven track record of human rights protection and engagement for human rights online can really uh, come in to support that type of activity. And the third objective will be promoting and protecting human rights online in the context of cybersecurity. The whole cybersecurity debate is often framed in terms of either technical security or government responsibilities and, and competences to do uh, this and that, to invest which areas, to invest which uh, government agencies have what kind of competences. But of course, all of this, whatever governments and even private sector and those who run the or the networks and the hardware, there's always this human rights element that needs to be introduced into the cybersecurity debate. So that will be one of our focuses to have protection of online communications figure prominently in all these debates on cybersecurity. For that, we are also thinking of uh, coming up with a statement on human rights impact of cybersecurity laws. As I said, all of this is still in the draft program phase, but uh, you will hopefully see throughout the year, throughout the next years, some of these uh, joint statements and activities that I've mentioned come to fruition. If not next year, then there's always the possibility to pass on things to the uh, subsequent presidency. This is not a one-year program that we have, but we actually pick up things that previous uh, chairmanships have taken up and we pass on the flag uh, to others that will come after. I've mentioned the the new uh, internal phase we're in after the Stockholm, the new Stockholm Tales reference and the, the network that we have. There's also one important uh, change in the Stockholm Tales reference about a membership, who can become a member, and the coalition has introduced a new category of observer countries. So for those countries who at the moment may not feel uh, convinced enough to become a formal member, uh, that's why the coalition has introduced this observer status, a kind of trial phase to see whether the country would fit into the structure, whether they like what we do. So we would try to do outreach on, on both fields, convincing more countries to become a member but also trying to get more countries interested in becoming an observer so that we have a broader base. Right now, 30 members was mentioned already, but uh, to be honest, most of them are from, let's say, northern or western uh, countries, the northern and western hemisphere. We have 
very prominent, and very active members actually from all continents, but maybe not enough from Asia, South America, and, and Africa. So we will try to do uh, outreach together with our members from those areas and with the Secretariat and everybody else to uh, advertise uh, our cause and to make more countries join this coalition in the sense of having really a kind of uh, group that is ready to fight for human rights online and to have a larger group even. And uh, finally, all this work is not done by drafting text and, and statements, but we really need uh, the experts in all the various multilateral places where activities of the UN and uh, norm setting is being negotiated. We want to try to revitalize the, the local networks that we have. Geneva, New York, Paris, where UNESCO is undertaking a lot of activities that are directly of interest for human rights online. And of course, Vienna and other places where things may be uh, coming up. And the point of having these networks is really, especially here in Geneva, it's not just Human Rights Council, it's also ITU, UNCTAD, uh, other areas and other organizations where human rights online issue may come up. Doesn't mean that we want to take them there, but uh, the network has to be alert so that we can inform each other and really uh, not be surprised by developments, but that we can play this active role that we as a, co uh, as a coalition want to play. And finally, the uh, annual conference that will be hosted in Berlin by the end of 2018. Of course, again, with the support of uh, civil society, private sector, anyone who supports uh, the coalition work and is ready to engage. That's more or less a short run-up of what we are hoping to be able to achieve next year with the support of everyone. And uh, well, for the network, I would give back to you and other speakers so as to explain what we have in mind with our non-governmental players. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ambassador. So I, I think since about 2013, the coalition has tried to engage uh, a broad section of civil society and the business community in helping it develop its thinking. Um, initially, that ran through a series of working groups which were established at the Tunis Conference, uh, which completed their mandate uh, earlier this year in Stockholm. And the, since then, there's been a, pro a process of thinking about the best way of engaging a, what, a broader community in some of those discussions. I'll just first of all invite Peter from the German government to say a little bit about why the governments see the engagement of a broader community is important to their work. And then I'll come to people from outside those governments to explain how we've got to the kind of process we've now got to. Yeah, let me start um, maybe by stating that very simply, so this is something that you might have heard a couple of times already at this IGF, but it's still true, it's very important that human rights online is a complex field, technology is changing fast and so are the challenges related to human rights online, so it's very important for a coalition like the Freedom Online Coalition um, to stay up to date on those developments and this is only realistically possible if also the private sector, civil society, academia and so on are involved in the discussions. And so this is one very important principle of the Freedom Online Coalition. So this is why the Freedom Online Coalition has embraced it and why we try to make sure that such advice from a diverse point of view of the various stakeholders who are involved in human rights online is being taken on board. Um, so this has been set, for example, already into the talent agenda that Pert has mentioned, that this is one basic working principle of Freedom Online Coalition member states, but also of the Freedom Online Coalition as a whole. And this is also why the annual conferences of the Freedom Online Coalition, since its inception, always involve a large array of civil society, business, academia, actors, and so on. So technically, these conferences are also in a multi-stakeholder format, and many of the sessions are also developed in a grassroots format. Um, so this was always, say, the most apparent single feature of the Freedom Online Coalition in terms of outreach were the annual conferences. So this continues. And Andrew has mentioned already the working groups. So the Freedom Online Coalition felt that the more intense um, engagement with other actors, so apart from the annual conferences, were necessary. And 
this is one um, important element which uh, Germany also took up when joining the Freedom Online Coalition in 2013. And um, one of our first measures was we instated a um, national roundtable on internet and human rights. So this was actually um, um, a consequence of our joining of Freedom Online Coalition. And this is still un up until now um, a frequent format um, which we um, happily organize and which gives us a lot of important input. Um, so the creation of the advisory network that we are talking about now goes back to um, the FOC strategic review process, which we've already been mentioning. Um, so it goes back to um, 2015 when it all started and um, it was a long process. We created the new Stockholm Terms of Reference. Um, also the, um, the US have been particularly active in this process. Um, I see some of the actors who were involved sitting here in the room. Um, so, and the advisor network was one of the most uh, tricky parts because of course it's not really straightforward. How can a coalition which, drives, uh, which aims at driving the foreign policy agenda, which consists of government who undertake foreign policy, how can this, be, uh, this coalition be informed by multi-stakeholder advice? So we had to be creative. Um, it was a long process and we had to um, go back to advice of experienced stakeholders to do so. And luckily we've already had the working groups of um, the Freedom Online Coalition. So this is why we um, teamed up with um, some of the most experienced stakeholders. So we have um, Matthew Shears and Catherine Kendrick sitting here who were the chairs of uh, working group one um, or working group three respectively. Um, and who, um, so we are really glad that we have them on board and that they're still supporting um, um, as much the, the agenda of the Freedom Online Coalition and are happy to engage in this advisory network, also as interim chairs. And they will, um, uh, in a moment, they will um, explain how exactly the new advisory network will work. Um, yeah, just to very quickly talk about the process um, in, in which, with which we created this new mechanism. So it all um, also goes back, of course, to the adoption of the terms of reference in Stockholm. And um, this led us to um, a drafting process, which was um, followed by several consultations with our FOC stakeholders at the margins of RightsCon last year. At the margins of the Stockholm meeting, we had substantial exchanges on how this advisor network actually should work, what are the expectations from civil society, and likewise, we also communicated what are our expectations as FOC governments. So how can this collaboration, which hasn't been tested before, how can this best work? So we really, I think, engaged in an open-ended and creative consultation process, which led us to many conclusions. And in the actual drafting process which followed, which was firstly undertaken by FOC governments um, to deliver like a, a basis conception of what we expect, was informed by all those discussions and tried to take all those varying angles and viewpoints on board. And um, after this drafting process, we instated a chartering group, which now consisted of the governments of Germany, Finland, Costa Rica, and um, on the stakeholder side of Matthew Shears and Catherine Kendrick. Um, so we um, engaged then in substantive discussions once again on our draft and uh, changed quite a bit, I think, and engaged furthermore in another round of public consultations then on our produce. And um, these consultations also yielded some substantive conclusions on what we possibly should change. So once again, we sat down in this chartering group and uh, redrafted the terms of reference and this is pr practically the point where we are right now. And um, so this was an yeah, intense engagement. Maybe now I hand over to Matthew and uh, Catherine to explain how this went about and what the advisory network now looks like. Yeah, so Catherine, do you wanna kick us off? Thank sure. you. Thank you so much. Uh, so Peter described the process that brought us to the current terms of reference and I'll briefly explain the modalities of the uh, advisory network that we're launching for applications today. Uh, the advisory network will be 25 individuals representing a broad array of sectors and geographies. Two of those individuals will, will serve as co-chairs of the advisory network, uh, playing a facilitating role in uh, collecting input from the different stakeholders within the network and liaising with the governments. And the mandate of the advisory network is really that it will serve as a key mechanism for the coalition governments to engage with non-governmental internet stakeholders on a regular basis. 
to support the FOC's mission of advancing human rights online and to be instrumental in ensuring multi-stakeholder engagement in the work of the FOC broadly, uh, both day-to-day -day and the specific conferences and events that the uh, FOC undertakes. It's important to note that this network is not meant to be a gatekeeper for civil society engagement with the FOC governments. Um, rather, it's a standing resource to those governments, uh, sort of recognizing the value of having an established structure for that engagement. Uh, but it will be complemented by engagement by others uh, outside of the advisory network. Thanks, Catherine. Um, I think it's important to know what the specific relationship is between the advisory network and the FOC. So you've, on your flyer, you've got a, a highlights of what those are and um, just to kind of walk through them. So the, the, advisory net, the relationship between the FOC and the advisory network is expected to be ongoing and um, 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 collaborative. And um, so there will be opportunities for the advisory network to input on the FOC government's activities as follows, um, to provide advice and recommendations on any and all substantive issues and procedures and relevant matters that are within the FOC's mandate. Um, to contribute to and participate in subordinate entities such as ad hoc or ongoing working groups um, and specific policy topics um, that make recommendations to the FOC. So let me just pause on that because what we had in the, what Catherine and the working groups that Catherine and I were involved in were ongoing annual, um, multi-annual actually, working groups. Um, and these are different. These are, these are ad hoc in the sense that they will pop up and address a particular issue and then they will go away again. And so there's an opportunity to engage in those working groups as they evolve when they address specific issues. Um, that the uh, advisory network can also recommend uh, topics for development of FOC statements. It's an important um, development and something that didn't exist before now. Um, and will be an offered an opportunity to input into the drafting process. And it's also, of course, going to participate in the annual conferences and meetings and other events. And will also assist with the organization and dissemination on information on the FOC. So it's a, it's a different type of relationship now, whereas the relationship with the, with the multi-stakeholder community was very much through the working groups and at the annual conferences. Now it's more of an ongoing and, um, relationship in which there's opportunity to contribute to the work product of the FOC, so that marks a, a particular type of change. In our conversations about the TOR and how to shape this advisory network, I think Matthew and I certainly and many of those who submitted input through the open consultation brought some of the lessons learned from the working group experience, trying to derive both what had worked well and incorporate lessons of things that could have worked better. And I think one of the, the main values that we saw in the working group experience was the opportunity to have a trusted forum to engage with governments, to share concerns on both sides and have a candid conversation. And so we've designed the advisory network together and with outside uh, input through the consultation to serve as that type of forum. If I can just add to that, um, Catherine used a very important word earlier on. She said that the role of the, of the co-chairs, um, um, we, we are interim co-chairs, um, is to act as facilitators and not gatekeepers. One of the concerns that was raised by, um, in the consultation was this notion that somehow the relationship would be between the FOC and the co-chairs and not with the advisory network, and that is not the case. So it's important to clarify that because that was one of those things that was raised um, at least uh, on a couple of occasions. Um, I think it's probably also useful just to say that um, I think in terms of the ongoing the process from going from now, um, this, is the the, this is the formal launch of the advisory network. Um, Catherine and I are on board as interim co-chairs. Um, we have put the um, application process up on the website, so that's available for you to access. Um, and the deadline, unless somebody already mentioned it, for applications is January 11. So please do um, bear that in mind when you're going off on holidays and other places. Um, we very much encourage you to participate. Um, this is a, a somewhat of a unique opportunity. Um, it's very different than what it was before with the working groups, but I think it will be equally rewarding. Um, and um, we have room for up to 25 participants in the advisory network. 
and we will be putting together a process for um, the election of the next um, set of co-chairs, um, and that will occur over the, the first couple of quarters of next year. Um, any mm -hmm. thoughts on anything? I think that's it. Maybe I can add as well, um, still some probably important points. So um, to explain a little bit what is the value added for governments to have this particular advisor network and not something else. And the big value added is that this advisor network will enable to, will be enabled by the structure to feed into ongoing FOC activities. So if there's an ongoing drafting process, this advisor network will be able to provide advice. So it will be extremely relevant what the advisor network says, says because it directly feeds into the work of the coalition. And I think this is maybe the, the biggest difference of the uh, advisor network to the previous structure we've had. And so this was also one point of concern. The previous structure was vice versa, that there was a somewhat indirect connect between the work of the Freedom Online Coalition and the work of the working groups. And now we've really addressed this shortcoming and brought those two into one process together. And so what we really hope to achieve is to have one advisory network, which is, so it's a small group of 25 stakeholders. And this is also for a purpose, so that the small group is manageable by the co-chairs that the small group can also, that the people can gain confidence among each other, that they can create good working relationships and that they can have intentive and intense discussions also on the topics. So that we have a really a think tank of trusted advisors which can work with the Freedom Online Coalition and which is happy to engage on this platform for multi-stakeholder dialogue with the FOC on devising good foreign policy on Freedom Online. This is really the, this would be the ideal outcome. And this is also why we think it's extremely valuable. And um, there are two more features maybe which I, I would like to highlight about the new terms of reference, which are really, um, you know, which really make the advisory network hopefully a success is that, so on one point, it's a two-way engagement. We, um, we can collect advice when we need it because we have an ongoing activity, but at the same time, the advisory network can always provide good suggestions, can highlight events, can propose topics, and can engage with the FOC. Secondly, this will happen also because we have now a very clear relationship between the advisor network and the Freedom Online Coalition. So it is the co-chairs of the advisor network and it is the chair of the Freedom Online Coalition who will be the primary contact points. So there will be a frequent engagement and it will be informal. We hopefully will have, um, or we already have a trusted relationship. Um, we will have furthermore quarterly calls between the entire advisor network and the Freedom Online Coalition member states. Um, and we will have regular meetings at the margins of international conferences. So we, this is actually a good practice the Online Coalition already had, but we will just continue it and make it also explicitly part of the advisor network. And, and we have, as I already mentioned, a clear role for the advisor network to feed into ongoing activities. So the relationship between advisor network and FOC has been clarified. And this is, I think, what hopefully makes up for a good mechanism. So we are really looking forward to your applications for the advisor network, then, uh, then because of course we need good people. And this is why we are really happy to, to distribute here at the IGF. I think this is the perfect venue to reach out to um, the global internet governance community is also active on human rights online. And this is why we are really happy to distribute to you this flyer and share with you the call for applications now officially. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, and I mean, I've been around international politics for 20 years, and I, I'm very aware that governments are often influenced by private companies in private in the shaping of their policy. But I can't think of another issue or mechanism where governments have opened up the development of their diplomacy to the input from a broad range of, of participants, including from civil society. So I think it's a very unusual mechanism and a very welcome one for the coalition to have adopted. So I'm going to throw it open now. Any questions? I mean, I think there are two possible lines of questioning or contribution. One is on the work program as outlined by the government of Germany. The second is on the advisory network itself and any questions you may have about that. Or if you have any other questions about the operation of the coalition, about the way we do things and why we do things and how things are working, then feel free to do that and we'll, we'll farm those questions out between us. So I'll throw it open to the platform now. We have other governments here as well who may want to contribute their own, their own thoughts, and I'd also invite them to, to, to kind of add their contributions. So just if you just wave at me, I can um, bring you in. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Dieter. Thank you all for your the contributions, and uh, thank you to the uh, incoming German um, chair of the FOC for uh, the aspirational and inspirational program of work for the next year. Um, I think this will um, invigorate the work of the FOC, and uh, we are definitely very happy with uh, the way um, the advisory network is, is, is uh, taking shape. Um, and we are thrilled by the fact that we can now, in this circle of, of, of governments working together um, in a consistent manner, take on board the input from, from other stakeholders. That will definitely enrich our, our policies. We are, we are, we are, we're confident, very confident about that. Um, about the work plan, uh, I would just like to underscore that apart from doing our part to contribute to the proper working of the advisory network, of the, of the good interaction between the advisory network and the FOC uh, as a member. We um, also would uh, uh, like to um, uh, contribute uh, to important, um, um, uh, important challenges, um, for example, in the area of, of um, safeguarding space for civil society. We are concerned about a shrinking space for civil society online, and we would definitely like to join in with others in working in the framework of the FOC uh, to find ways to, to um, counter that, um, that development. Uh, th what we also would like to uh, um, do is, is, is contribute from our part to uh, the diplomatic network, uh, the diplomatic outreach, that um, the German chairmanship is, is, is um, very diligently um, uh, promoting. I think diplomatic coordination in key um, cities where important multilateral discussions about human rights uh, issues that are relevant for, for digital rights and freedom online are taking place is absolutely uh, fundamental uh, in order to, to, uh, to create that global a uh, wave of, of uh, support for freedom online. That's very necessary, taking into account the threat. And um, um, what we also hope to do is to, to, to contribute uh, from our part to the existing excellent relationship between the FOC and Digital Defenders Partnership, which uh, in our view embodies um, the FOC's uh, members' commitment to actually in practice promoting and helping to safeguard freedom online for defenders, um, um, uh, for, the, for human rights defenders. Very, very important, uh, um, very important uh, cooperation and, um, and, 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 and uh, definitely something we, we attach great importance to. Finally, I just would like to, 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 to add a, f a few words about uh, the way we as a Freedom Online Coalition uh, can um, enhance even more uh, our profile and, and our, our, our credentials um, in, um, in bringing about more, more freedom online in the world. And that is by um, referring to what we have taken on board in the terms of reference, the Stockholm terms of reference, the fact that we are going to engage in peer learning. We, as members of the, F F of the FOC, have um, committed ourselves to uh, on a regular basis, uh, talking to each other, sharing information about um, w challenges and, um, we face at home and, uh, and good practices that we can share with others and that will help us also as members of the FOC to, uh, be, uh, to, to be champions of the commitments that we have engaged in. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, again, I'm going to throw it open. I, I realize it's customary at the IGF for all the conversation to happen in the coffee bar and for the meetings to be treated as a place where you catch up with your email, do Facebook, social media, Twitter, or have a little sleep. Um, let's change that tradition today and actually have some conversation in the meeting room rather than uh, keeping it all for outside. So do feel free, please, to ask your questions, contributions, thoughts. We're uh, very keen to hear what you have to say. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Otherwise, my gavel's coming out, yeah. Before I say my comment, I'm warning you, you forced me to say it. So. Oh, oh, okay. excellent. No, it's okay. No, I was just uh, wondering, uh, in the new terms of reference, there's um, a chapter about termination and about... Uh, uh, sorry, just say uh, you. Oh, sorry, yes. I'm Luis Fernando Garcia. I'm director of R3D, Digital Rights Defense Network from Mexico, Civil Society Group from Mexico. 
Um, there's, in the terms of reference, there's a, a part about termination of membership and there's a process about revision of the, uh, how members comply with the, um, with the membership responsibilities. I'm wondering if um, you have devised a process for this because the, the terms of reference are understandably general. Um, um, particularly, I mean, I'm speaking because my, my concern about my government not being part of, uh, or not complying with responsibilities, but I'm, I'm wondering whether you have thought, n not particularly about Mexico, but about everyone, uh, a, pro a procedure and whether uh, uh, the advisory group or, or other stakeholders may play a part in either recommending the chair to initiate a process and or be involved in the, in the um, somehow in the process of revision of this uh, compliance with the responsibilities. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there's been a, a long-term call from civil society groups for there to be some internal mechanism inside the coalition to deal with, with, with governments who may fall below the standards they set themselves. So this is, in fact, this was agreed back in Stockholm that this mechanism would be established. Um, where we've reached to now is that there is a, we've, we've commissioned a, some work on establishing such a process and the criteria. That has now just been completed, that first phase. It's now out to the governments for consultation because, as you would appreciate, it's essentially a deeply political... I mean, there is a certain amount of... It's quasi-judicial in terms of assessing its criteria, but it's also deeply political in terms of how the governments act on that. So we would hope that in the next kind of couple of months there'll be a, a mechanism which can then be publicly be published and available for people for for comment, and I think there would be, a, and clearly the advisory group could raise those issues and concerns. Um, the decision clearly would rest with the governments themselves, which you would expect. But, but yeah, no, that mechanism is underway. I would expect it to be up and operational in the next few months. So that is something that's come from this side of the table for some time, and it's now been enacted. Yeah. And we, there'll be more details to follow. Anyone else like to? Uh, just say who you are, mate. Sure, it's me. Uh, Melody Petri from Access Now. I just wanted to commend um, the FOC because last year you issued uh, a historic statement against intentional state-sponsored disruptions of access to or dissemination of information online, so internet shutdowns, internet disruptions, whatever uh, they are called. However, what we noticed is that since last year we actually recorded uh, the biggest number of internet disruptions in around the world, 77, compared to much lower number uh, in 2016 and in uh, 2015. So I was wondering if you were planning to do more outreach, and we know that some, um, some of these disruptions, for example, take place during elections, and some uh, countries are involved in, for example, monitoring uh, elections, uh, sending obser observers to, to, to countries during those missions and whether as part of these mandates and as part of this cooperation, having some language and explaining um, the implications of internet disruptions during, during elections could be, could be included. Yeah, I think it's, thanks for raising that concern. Yeah, I, it has been a uh, preoccupation for the governments and we've certainly, inside the coalition, done a lot of work with our existing members to actually ensure that they understand the purpose of the policy and to avoid network disruptions in some pretty critical elections that have taken place. I mean, I think you're right. This is a, it's a growing problem. And I think it, it underlines the importance that uh, the ambassador set out, not just of developing the policy framework, but really building the diplomatic coordination and outreach to actually enact those statements, which is why I think that the German plan to build really strong networks in Geneva, Paris, and New York and to engage in much more outreach with, with governments in the Global South, and particularly in areas where, as, as you will know, the network shutdowns are particularly prevalent, I think becomes a very big priority. So I think that's what we would, we will, we will look to see under the German leadership, whether we can step up those efforts to actually match that. Because I think you're right, it's, and I don't, we don't see it as a problem that's gonna diminish in the future. We think, we think it's gonna be a problem, particularly as you've said around elections uh, in the period to come. So it remains uh, a key priority. And I think with all of the, the policy statements, they are both, they have an internal function inside the coalition. 
to strengthen the hand of the human rights voice inside a government, and they have an external function, which is to reach out to other countries. So I think both, both are a key part of the agenda. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Ephraim Pasikinyanito. Um, former working group two member, Detroit Development, um, and from Kenya, Article 19 Kenya office. Uh, so just to build on to that comment, uh, when Kenya, we had elections this year, uh, previously during the year, beginning of the year, there, were, there was a yes or no statement from the minister and from the ministries on whether there was going to be a shutdown on the internet. One of the leverages that we used when we were talking to uh, the government, the Kenyan government, was the fact of their membership to the FOC, to the OGP, to all these processes for them to keep the internet open. So just wanted to emphasize on what Mendeley said and go beyond just outreach regarding internet shutdowns, but also outreach regarding membership um, for African countries. It would be really, really good to move beyond Kenya um, and Ghana uh, to other partners with good standards, for example, South Africa and others, for them to uh, improve uh, for them to join this coalition and to share standards and for this coalition to have more representation from my region. And that can be good, especially for civil society, uh, for us to keep them to task to their international commitments that they have done within this coalition and other coalitions. Thank you. Can you hear it back? No, no, I think you need to use a mic. Yeah. Oh, we're both participants, yes. Okay, so um, first of all, just uh, I, my name is Jason Pielemeyer. I'm with the Global Network Initiative. Uh, and I want to just, uh, on behalf of the Global Network Initiative, commend uh, all the FOC members for all of the uh, wonderful advances that have been set out uh, today and, and really been the fruit of a lot of very hard work uh, over the last couple of years. Um, I want to also thank Catherine and um, uh, everybody else who's uh, been a part of the, and Matthew and everybody else who's been a part of the kind of external network around uh, the FOC um, for all of your work. Um, I really think that um, the FOC is, is making a significant uh, advancement uh, with the, ter the Stockholm Terms of Reference. Um, uh, and we're very excited about the advisory network and how that is shaping up. Uh, I have a lot of interest in that. Um, uh, I don't. Re I have one question at the end that I'll come to, but just a couple points I want to make. Um, one on on uh, Melody's point about shutdowns. Just to note, um, GNI is very concerned as well uh, on that topic, and we had a really good uh, joint call between GNI and the FOC on that topic, which I think was was quite useful for members on both sides and um, a good example of the kind of cooperation that uh, the FOC can and should. Uh, seek more of uh, with external actors. Um, I wanted to also note um, that uh, GNI will be holding its uh, next board meeting uh, in Paris in February. We'll be holding an event there uh, with UNESCO uh, on elections and the ICT sector and um, very much hope that uh, the UNESCO FOC network, uh, maybe if it's not already sort of uh, revitalized, uh, um, Maybe we can use that as an opportunity to have some engagement with, with the network of FOC members in Paris. Uh, so just putting that on your calendars. Um, and then lastly, to Carmen's point about um, peer learning, um, I think you know, there that's a really important uh, component, uh, and I think it picks up a bit on what a friend said as well about uh, that the role that uh, membership in the FOC plays. Uh, certainly external stakeholders can use that membership as, uh, as a talking point, as a point of reference. Uh, and hold countries uh, to their commitments. Um, but, but also, just curious for thoughts, uh, perhaps from Ambassador Fitch and Peter, the German government in particular, on um, how to use the coalition to continue to build capacity among member states um, in a more proactive fashion. Can I, because we're short of time. Do you want to come back to say anything? Do you guys want to say anything? No? No, but I have. Yeah. 
Just a, a very brief clarification. Um, somebody noted in an email to me who's watching um, that the deadline on the uh, FOC website says January 4th. That's not correct. It's January 11th for applications. Thanks. Perhaps we should change that on the website. <coughs> Might be helpful. <laughs> Thanks. Ambassador. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for all these uh, questions and su suggestions. And first of all, thank you for the support that kind of uh, is coming out from, from the audience here. Just wanted to pick up a few points that were made. Uh, the point about the new provisions on termination. Uh, this was uh, hotly debated over uh, quite some time. FOC members, and I think if you look at the terms of reference, all the statutes, all the rules of procedure of other organizations, ours are really quite elaborate. There is a procedure with a lot of, lot of uh, feedback uh, possibilities, so that is already a quite elaborate provision. Uh, FOC members were aware that this type of, let's say, internal quality control, the kind of self-evaluation is really necessary uh, to keep ourselves to keep the to to keep the co coalition up to its uh, own high standards and uh, rest assured that this will be uh, taken seriously on the other hand it's of course also a delicate and sensitive process uh, to enter in so um, but as andrew said details of the procedure will have to be developed it's all fresh from the printer so to speak so we have to think about it on follow-up, whether it's shutdowns or any other of the papers. The statements that we, the general statements that we deliver are, of course, well, first of all, a statement by a group in a, in, a, in a given situation, or maybe sometimes even without a given situation as a general paper, but then it's really also up for coalition members themselves, but also for civil society, for anyone else to refer to this, to set this language in motion, to put it on tracks and, and have it uh, enter the discussion in the various countries. So it's not just that uh, these 30 countries or 30 plus hopefully in the future countries will uh, start talking about it, but that we create this language that then can be referred to. That's an old experience from anyone working in the, at the UN or at other international fora that once you have a good text, good wording that is out in the world that others can refer to, that can be quoted, that can be cross-referenced elsewhere, that's how it it's, it's being implemented also. The point about expanding membership in Africa, yes, I made the point uh, as one of our priorities before you arrived, so that's, that's uh, certainly covered in our, in our work plan. And uh, capacity building. Well, that's, that's another point that uh, I've heard in many of the panels uh, over the past uh, two or three days, and that's also something that the German government, we do have a capacity building strategy that has been adopted by the federal government. So this, it's, it's natural. If you want to, to make other states come up with rules, to subscribe to rules, to subscribe to norms, to enter institutions, to kind of come up with the, a common level of uh, performance, then we often hear the question that governments or other players are ready Yes, we'd love to join, but we can't because of lack of capacity. And that's why uh, it is certainly our conviction and that of uh, members of the coalition and the coalition as such that uh, to level this playing field, we have to bring everyone up to the same level and that capacity building is a necessity to ensure protection of human rights online, to ensure cyber security, to ensure uh, proper, for example, crime prevention and, and uh, law enforcement uh, online in other fields. It's all a matter of capacity. It, that doesn't mean necessarily hardware and software, things you can buy, but it's really the mentality and the, the uh, education and, of course, the political will that needs to be fostered and, and uh, promoted. So it's capacity building in a broader sense, not just handing over money uh, for governments to buy uh, hardware from anywhere, but uh, really the kind of the capacity to join the debate, the capacity to be responsive, to react, to be in the room, 
uh, to take positions to negotiate texts with the Freedom Online agenda uh, on, on, on everyone's mind. So that's what we consider capacity building, and it's, as I said, high on the agenda. Having said that, I think those were mostly the, the points and uh, suggestions that were made. If there are no others, are no, we I done? think we can probably, um, it's quite late now. Yep. yep, we've reached the end of the meeting. So can I thank the panel for their contributions and thank you for your attendance. Thank you very much. Nobody was, <laughs> nobody was out of order. The meeting is over. It's too peaceful. <laughs> the meeting is adjourned. That's how you do it. Oh, the meeting is adjourned. Yeah. Until next year. I think then, I don't know. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of nice, quite nice. Veritas, I want to play. And it's really, if you do it by people still have the photo, it's really cool. Yeah, I want to, I want to take it home with you. Thank you, guys. Thanks for all the work, by the way. Thanks for all the work. Getting us, getting us to this point. Good to have you here. You know, you were one of the first one, the, one of the Freedom Online, which was one of the first Freedom Online coalitions. Were you there at that point? No, I was not. I was not. I joined the coalition a few years ago. I'm still working. Yeah, and you'd be interested in that, right? Be careful, no. Yeah, thanks very much. I have to run to another meeting. Yeah, fine. Good to see you. Thanks, okay. I'll we'll be in touch with you. Yeah, great. Okay, okay. Sweet message. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, we'll be in touch with you.